Every year, in April, the seasonal aisles at grocery stores get filled with light-colored candies and decorations adorned with what we all recognize as the Easter Bunny. The Easter Bunny shows up on the morning of Easter and hides the brightly colored eggs around the house or in your yard for kids to wake up and find. Those parts of our modern Western Easter tradition can be found virtually everywhere. But why is it called Easter? And how did it become a holiday in the Western world at all? Well, it's a Christian holiday, of course, and it's actually the most important one. It is the celebration of Jesus of Nazareth rising from the dead three days after his crucifixion and death, fulfilling centuries of prophecy and redeeming mankind. Simple enough, right? I mean, even if you aren't religious, surely you can see how that would be a day to remember for those that are. But what the heck does any of that have to do with the word Easter? Why not call it Resurrection Sunday or something like that? And then there's the Easter Bunny and the colored eggs. Try as you might, you certainly won't find those things in the Bible. It bothered me for a long time, and it still does to some degree. And to this day, if you ask someone about the mythical bunny and the eggs and the word Easter, almost no one has a good answer, or has ever really even thought about it. And when you go looking or poking around for answers, oftentimes the first thing that pops up are the pagan origins of Easter, and how the visual part of the celebration of Easter and the word itself is a long-forgotten pagan festival with origins in none other than ancient Babylon one of the great historical enemies of Jews and Christians alike. One version of this origin story goes something like this. In Babylon, there was a goddess named Ishtar, or perhaps Ishtar, and she was a goddess of fertility, and two symbols of fertility were the rabbit and the egg. So an ancient celebration of this goddess morphed through the ages and made its way into Christianity around the time that Constantine made it a legal religion in the Roman Empire. Much of the pagan population kept the practice as it was, but the newly empowered Christian church, eager to convert pagans and get some visibility, moved its holy day of the resurrection to Ishtar, and thus the modern thing was born, and in time, its pagan roots nearly forgotten. So, for people generally hostile to religion, or maybe Christianity in particular, many of them go, aha, the holiday makes no sense, and it's just an amalgamation of pagan customs with Jewish and Christian customs blended in, so that the Church of Rome could gain some clout. And even if you're not hostile to religion, and heck, you might even be a believer yourself, you look at the confusing word Easter, and the rabbit, and the eggs, and you see the goddess Ishtar, her story, and you go, hmm, I knew something was off. I just wish more people knew about it. You might even stumble on another version of the Easter is Pagan history that moves further north into Europe, where a Celtic goddess, even more astonishingly named Easter, filled a similar role of fertility, and along with the rabbit and the eggs, had a celebration centered around her. And since Christianity would soon explode in the West, and see legendary figures like Patrick of Ireland moving around the Celtic world, some of that Celtic imagery and lingo bled into Christianity and cemented itself in a world where written texts like the Bible were hard to come by. Now, I'm not trying to infuse St. Patrick specifically into this story, but I will point out that his story, as discussed in my Patrick of Ireland episode, is only a couple hundred years at most removed from Constantine. The point there being the same basic story as the Ishtar narrative. As pagans were converted in the very early spread of Christianity, which was now then okay in the Roman Empire, they kept the traditions of Easter, and as time went on, those roots were forgotten, even by the church. Or some people might even say, intentionally hidden by the church. So no matter which story you pick at this point, it certainly looks bad for Christianity, right? After all, they're now taking their most important celebration and inadvertently filling it to the brim with what amount to idols and pagan practice. And every year, there will be new stories and blogs and Facebook memes saying as much. But is any of it true? That's what I set out to find for this episode. 
What is the root of Easter Sunday? So far, we have a Babylonian goddess, or Sumerian goddess, if you prefer, a Celtic goddess, a rabbit, some colorful eggs, and the resurrection of the Son of God, who came to save the world from its sins and eternal death. So let's start by unpacking Ishtar, that Babylonian goddess. And to make this as concise as I can, I will just quote the Encyclopedia Britannica page, published August 28, 2019, on Ishtar, in full. A link to all the sources used in this episode will be made available on loreandlegends.net and linked to in the episode description. So here we go. Ishtar, Akkadian, the Sumerian Inanna. In Mesopotamian religion, the goddess of war and sexual love, Ishtar is the Akkadian counterpart of the West Semitic goddess Astarte. Inanna, an important goddess in the Sumerian pantheon, came to be identified with Ishtar. But it is uncertain whether Inanna is also of Semitic origin, or whether, as is more likely, her similarity to Ishtar caused the two to be identified. In the figure of Inanna, several traditions seem to have been combined. She is sometimes the daughter of the sky god An, sometimes his wife. In other myths, she is the daughter of Nana, god of the moon, or of the wind god, Enlil. In her earliest manifestations, she was associated with the storehouse, and thus personified as the goddess of dates, wool, meat, and grain. The storehouse gates were her emblem. She was also the goddess of rain and thunderstorms, leading to her association with On, the sky god, and was often pictured with a lion, whose roar resembled thunder. The power attributed to her in war may have arisen from her connection with storms. Inanna was also a fertility figure, and, as goddess of the storehouse and the bride of the god Damuzi Amashagulamandala, I can't pronounce that, who represented the growth and fecundity of the date palm. She was characterized as young, beautiful, and impulsive, never as a helpmate or a mother. She is sometimes referred to as the Lady of the Date Clusters. Ishtar's primary legacy from the Sumerian tradition is the role of fertility figure. She evolved, however, into a more complex character, surrounded in myth by death and disaster, a goddess of contradictory connotations and forces, fire and fire quenching, rejoicing and tears, fair play and enmity. The Akkadian Ishtar is also, to a greater extent, an astral deity, associated with the planet Venus, with Shamash, the sun god, and Sin, the moon god. She forms a secondary astral triad. In this manifestation, her symbol is a star, with six, eight, or sixteen rays within a circle. As goddess of Venus, delighting in bodily love, Ishtar was the protectress of prostitutes and the patroness of the alehouse. Part of her cult worship probably included temple prostitution. Her popularity was universal in the ancient Middle East, and in many centers of worship, she probably subsumed numerous local goddesses. In later myth, she was known as Queen of the Universe, taking on the powers of On, Enlil, and Enki. So, while fertility is one of the things associated with Ishtar, it is far from the only thing, or even the main thing. There is also no mention at all of eggs or rabbits. Anywhere. Go look for yourself. In fact, her symbols are the gate, the lion, and the star. And her mythology is inconsistent at best. Taking on different parentages, roles, and powers in different places and at different times. And then there is the name, Ishtar. It's certainly similar to the word Easter, but in its original form, they are not in fact the same word, and even if you pronounce Ishtar as Ishtar, it's still not the same word. A case of mere coincidence that managed to fit a pretext. Now some more aspiring Easter is pagan claims will take the Ishtar premise and bring up separate stories of Tammuz and Inanna, who at some point was blended with Ishtar. Go check those out and see for yourself. There will be some links to those at loreandlegends.net. Is there really any connection at all? to the Easter of today? Set aside the Facebook memes that proliferate in many groups, and you'll realize that this is incredibly shaky at best, and that's probably giving it too much credit. Beyond that, try and find an actual link to Ishtar and the day of Easter itself. 
the Babylonians and the Sumerians just didn't operate like that. But we're not done with Ishtar yet. It gets more interesting. Because the Ishtar equals Easter story seems to originate from a book called The Two Babylons, written by a man named Alexander Hislop and published in 1853. Why is that interesting? Because Hislop was a minister in the Church of Scotland. So why would a Christian go about assaulting his own holiday? The answer is in that second Babylon in the title, which, according to Hislop, was the Roman Catholic Church. It's an easy bandwagon to jump on, criticizing the largest organized religious body on earth. Everybody sees the buildings and the Pope and yada yada yada. But you have to realize Hislop was a die-hard anti-Catholic Protestant. The book is rife with factual errors, but it caught on among a certain audience, filling the role of confirmation bias, or maybe some pseudo-history that could make some people feel as if they were enlightened and now had some secret knowledge. Now, I'm not here to defend the Catholic Church, or claim that nothing has ever been borrowed from one place or another. This episode is about the roots of Easter, and motivations and narratives are important in that regard. Again, I'll link to all this stuff at lorenlegends.net, and you can see for yourself. The Two Babylons is full of gigantic leaps in logic, and incredibly uninformed history. Hardline Protestants generally crap on Catholics, and vice versa. Nothing new there, really. It's been going on for centuries. So, did the Easter is Pagan narrative actually originate within Christianity itself? It sure seems that way when it comes to the Ishtar story. Especially if you consider that the timing of when to celebrate Easter was one of the first things done at the often misrepresented Council of Nicaea. But no one was talking about Ishtar. And this is the council that is associated with Constantine. In a nutshell, or perhaps an eggshell is more fitting, Eastern Christians elected to keep the date of the resurrection aligned with the Jewish Passover, and the Western Christians elected to keep it on the Sunday following the first full moon after March 21st. This was all about hashing out the institution of Christianity, which for the first time in history was mostly free to be practiced without fear of persecution. At this point, there wasn't much in the way of churches as we think of them today, or doctrine, or even publicly available scripture. But it does heavily imply that Easter was already a thing. It happened in the spring and was centered around the day believed to be when Jesus' tomb was found empty. Which, regardless of how you approach this episode, was believed to be a real event that happened on a real day, had witnesses, even hundreds of people who saw Jesus in the days after. All of this in the middle of a Jewish community where Christians were heretics, and all of this in the middle of an empire that demanded tribute to the imperial cult and saw the Roman emperor as a living god. Why is it so hard to believe that people putting themselves at risk socially and legally wouldn't be able to mark a few days on a calendar. So now we'll set Ishtar aside, but we're still stuck with the word Easter, the rabbit, and the eggs. So how about that Celtic goddess? Easter, Yoster, I'm not totally sure how to pronounce it, but it's spelled E-O-S-T-E-R. Spelled and pronounced almost the same as Easter, in a language not too far from English even. The story there is basically the same setup as the Ishtar story, but there's actually even less evidence for this one. The only reference to this goddess comes from an 8th century monk named Bede in a book he wrote called The Reckoning of Time, and in a specific chapter called The English Months. In this chapter, Bede is accounting for the months of the year according to the indigenous people of what is today Great Britain. And one of those months, aligned more or less with our modern April, was named Easter, or Yoster, E-O-S-T-R-E, after a local goddess of the sunrise and perhaps fertility. I will quote the section that mentions her, 
as written by Bede. Easter Manath has a name which is now translated Paschal Month, and which was once called after a goddess of theirs named Easter, in whose honor feasts were celebrated in that month. Now they designate that Paschal season by her name, calling the joys of the new rite by the time-honored name of the old observance. End quote. So finally, a smoking gun. But not so fast. Scholars, even ones who aren't religious, have been divided on this point for centuries, and still are to this day. Did Bede just completely fabricate this part? Why is there no other mention of this goddess anywhere else in any other context? Did this monk just start writing about the pagans outside and describing pagan-sounding beliefs to them? But there is some anecdotal evidence, based on names used for locations or even people, to suggest that such a goddess did exist at some point. And surely Bede, who lived in a time when pagan beliefs were by no means dead, could have had some first-hand insight into their beliefs. Even if you grant that, though, you're still stuck with the fact that the celebration of Jesus' resurrection had been ongoing for several hundred years at this point, though the name Easter absolutely did stick at this point. But that has less to do with a goddess, and more to do with time, and the name of the month in the place Bede was writing a book about how to reckon time, and how to figure out the dates of events, prominently including Easter. So the word Easter doesn't really have anything to do with the resurrection directly. That part is true. And it could well be a remnant of a pagan goddess even. But the intent in this context isn't a pagan religious one. It's just a word that's denoting a certain time period, as Bede is reckoning time. But we still have that pesky Easter bunny running around and hiding eggs everywhere. Surely these must be overtly pagan, right? There are no references to rabbits or egg dying in the Bible. That much is true. So where did this all come from? One extraordinarily common sense take on the rabbit is that the rabbit is literally a natural sign of spring. They begin competing for territory and looking for mates and can be seen in greater numbers in the early morning. You can just go outside anywhere, not in a concrete jungle, and see this for yourself. I have three or four that run around my own backyard almost every day at this time of year. So it may well be as simple as, in the month of Easter, the rabbits start showing up. There are, of course, plenty of ideas and thoughts that the rabbits must have been ritually important to some people at some point, but it's just an idea. More on the rabbit in a bit. So what about the eggs? The eggs are maybe the most complex issue in the depiction of Easter. The eggs have a little different background depending on where and when, and they seem to have evolved as time went on. Eggs are, of course, an overt symbol of birth and life. That's not even a religious thing, that's just an it's-a-freaking-egg thing. In that regard, humans have regarded eggs in that way, likely since humans first identified what an egg actually was. That being said, eggs have been associated with the resurrection for a very long time, which is pretty natural, really. In fact, if the argument is that some practice was blatantly co-opted into Christianity, then this might be it. It's just that the practice in question here wasn't religious in nature. It was just a custom that took on a deeper and more powerful meaning once the religion came along. A visual aid of sorts. Something to make you think. Something that you can see and hold. And in this case, eat. In some areas, the eggs were traditionally dyed red, symbolizing the blood shed on the cross. But the egg itself, representing not just the tomb, but life escaping the tomb. In some denominations, there is even a blessing set aside for the eggs in particular on Easter. As far as the idea of the Easter egg hunt, or the hidden eggs, there's a few things at work here. One is very much Christian in nature. Lent is a time of year just prior to Easter that is intended to be a reflection of Jesus' 40 days fasting in the desert that culminated in his temptation by Satan, which is a fascinating bit with some great implications you should read, by the way. But anyway, 
During Lent, people generally give something up, and in many denominations to this day, that includes meat, dairy, eggs, and in some places, even fruit and other items. Now, I have chickens myself, and I get nearly a dozen eggs a day from as many hens at this time of year. So if you lived in an era before industrial farming, what would a major source of protein be? And if you got even just one or two eggs a day, how many eggs might you have at the end of a 40-day period? You'd probably have a pretty killer scrambled egg breakfast come Easter. That sounds kind of silly, but that's exactly what many scholars point to. And it's well documented that people have been abstaining from eggs for Lent nearly as far back as you can look. So imagine on Easter, when Lent was over, mom and dad sending the kids to gather all of the eggs that had accumulated. It's stupid simple, huh? So now, how did the rabbit in the eggs get mixed up and into their present-day form of an organized Easter egg hunt? We've seen so far that Easter is a reference to a time of year in this context, spring to be specific, and that rabbits become more active as the winter is now over, and birds, including chickens, begin to lay more eggs. One story of German origin that I found on heraldzeitung.com goes like this. One day, a woman hid some colorful eggs in her garden for her children to find. No religion needed there. Just a mother playing a game with her children. As the children discovered the eggs in the garden, they saw a large rabbit hopping away and thought perhaps the rabbit had left behind the unusual eggs. Now this is a very common story you can find, and one that took root in Germany. When people immigrated to America, they brought that new custom with them, and in time, the modern commercialized Easter we see today was born. Now I fully admit that all the stuff we see at this time of year in regards to Easter is a bit confusing, especially if you start looking for the reasons why. But that's because it's hundreds, if not thousands of years of sometimes unrelated observations and customs, religious or not, that get stacked on top of each other and give rise to entirely new customs with entirely new meanings. So could Ishtar have had something to do with spring at some point? Sure, why not? Is the word Easter a riff on a Germanic or a Celtic deity? It certainly seems that way. But do either of those things have anything to do with the biggest celebration in Christianity? No, not at all really. So be sure to check out the link to loreandlegends.net in the episode description, and it will take you to an episode-specific page with links to the material used to help make this episode. <clears throat> Some of the sources I list will argue the opposite of what this episode is saying. So feel free to leave a comment on loreandlegends.net or on facebook.com slash loreandlegends and let me know what you think. Or drop a link to any other evidence or sources you have. If you like any episode of the show, share it. And if you haven't, check out some of the older episodes. That's the best way you can help me grow Lore and Legends. That's all I had for this episode. See you next time. music in this episode, The Complex, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io. Thanks to your support, I was actually able to buy a license for that one. The next song was The Desert City, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Sneaky Snitch, by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Gregorian Chant by Kevin McLeod, available at filmmusic.io, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Be sure to check out the episode description 